and the nurses and everybody has been taking great care to see her in this present state. Okay. The senior surgeon specialist at Kenema Government Hospital, Einstein Levy, deals with the serious injuries inflicted by the rebels. March, we had compound fractures of the hip and also multiple lacerated wounds. Then there were some with entry and exit of bullet through the abdomen then multiple wounds of the small and large bowels. Then among these civilian casualties, you have a picture here, which at, at least a few were able to lay hands on. This was an old man who was macheted in the bush by a rebel, probably his own tribe, we don't know. But he was macheted, and according to the man's information, he told us that he, the man said he was dead. But he was picked up by the soldiers and he was brought here a day after which was treated and is recovered. The wound healed satisfactorily and is back to his work. And this other young man had a multiple lacerated wound, about nine places on the back and about seven on the head. He was brought at least two days after the injury, but he was treated and he's gone back home as well. So most of the injuries are either gunshot wounds or, or machete slashes? Yes, because I was, as I was made to understand, most of the rebels had, were out of ammunition, so they were using machetes. This is the second serious case in the world at the moment. This man was struck with a sharp object uh, in an ambush. And uh, because of lack of poor communication transport, he was kept in the bush for some time. While in the whole leg developed cellulitis, which became infected later. Right now, I think there is chance now to do skin grafting. So that uh, if we do skin grafting, there will be less deformity. Because if the whole sky is being formed here, actually it will be difficult for him for easy movement of the limb. Because of the negative attitude of central government, this Western trained surgeon and his colleagues have been forced into extreme situations in order to maintain the service. We had a lot of difficulties, especially the medical logistics like drugs, bandages, drips, gauze, cutting wood. So we had to use our own materials, right? And also we had to pass around to people for donations to help us. And that was the only way we were able to actually help most of the civilian, I mean, the casualties. So you brought your own personal instruments over to the Personal instruments and personal materials as well. So suturing materials, gauze and cutting wood. You get paid for that? No. We felt that since the army, the military people were giving up their lives in the bush, saving the country, and the uh, it would have sound senseless for us to ask them to pay us. You see, uh, that was our own little effort we could do towards uh, war effort. The faces of these men tell a story. They are longing to regain the use of their legs and return to life. They are longing for the happiness and youthful mobility it can bring. When news of the coup in Sierra Leone went out, international reaction was hostile. The United States announced it was evacuating all its citizens. France sent a frigate to Sierra Leone waters on standby. Frankly speaking, I was surprised because they knew what the problems were. The problem was that the international community had not taken time to study closely the situation in Sierra Leone before the coup. Well, Sierra Leone is a long way from Europe or the United States. The main reason for the international community's initial hostility was that before the coup, a multi-party transition was underway in Sierra Leone. The APC government had lifted the ban on opposition parties, a new draft constitution had been written, international experts had visited Sierra Leone to advise on certain aspects of the election arrangements, the world was convinced that Sierra Leone, after nearly two decades of a one-party dictatorship, was now finally on an irreversible path towards peace 
and free and fair elections and a new age of genuine democracy. What the world did not know was that in fact President Momo and his men were engaged in an elaborate exercise, deceiving the international community that the process was going well, but manipulating the process at home with the aim of holding on to power. The rigging had started right from the word go. How, how and, and was it going? Well, they had, their, they had their own people registering, just people they believed would support the APC in any subsequent election. We have abundant evidence to show that you know, these people were bent on rigging the election, and they were just kind of just trying to play up, you know, play like, like, like you have a parliamentarian playing up to the gallery, you know, saying, saying the kind of things, you know, the people, the, the, the people who want to hear. But they, 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 didn't, they, they were not serious, they were not sincere. The journalists also spotted the government's foul play. They had to, you know, over-register their own supporters and under-register supporters of the opposition parties. From that point, everybody knew that the APC had no genuine intention to, re to, to you know, organize or, you know, oversee a smooth and peaceful and free multi-party elections. In fact, that was our concern, that the APC, in reality, was not uh, meaningful in ushering multipartism. They could have been influenced by external forces. This wind of change in uh, this glass nose perestroika stuff, and uh, the, 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 the new wave by the American government you know, to spread democracy all over. And they knew they were heavily indebted, so they had no alternative. So um, superficially, they were, they were faking this multipartism. And if you look at the internal structures that they were creating, for instance, the um, um, first vice president, you know, was made minister of internal affairs because he could have been in a position to ensure APC victory. And this opposition leader says the whole arrangement saw the APC government dressed in fancy clothes but still playing the old tricks. We registered a newspaper long before even the multi party was announced. So, uh, yeah, the paper was new breed. And there was a time even this paper carried a story, we got a story about the, the APC, the top hierarchy of the APC, they had heard a meeting on the, on the war, on, on, and again on how they could prolong their stay in power. The paper came out, then of course the CID were here by 11 o'clock, they came and arrested our editor and uh, our chairman, and they took him to CID. He was there for over three, four days, being questioned and everything. What is your view about the APC government's behavior uh, during this multi-party democratic process? It was our view, in fact, not only our party, all these other parties, they were all grumbling that the government was not going to do it fairly. They had removed the, 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 the electoral commissioner, chief electoral commissioner, who we all had said he should stay, Mr. Max Bailoff, because everybody had respect for him. And this opposition leader is convinced that violence was going to be a hallmark of the APC government's grand plan. Three days before uh, this takeover, uh, the APC planned a rally at McKinney. One of the towns in the northern province? In the northern province, yes. They planned a rally at McKinney. And McKinney was the place where I had gone, uh, where I received a resounding, a tumultuous welcome. Over 200,000 people turned out to welcome me. That was embarrassing to President Momo. Bear in mind that President Momo comes from that area. And All the top echelons of the APC come from that area. For me to have received that kind of welcome was more surprising. So they planned a rally at McKinney on a Saturday, the following Saturday. And um, I understand the fact they had hired somebody to prepare matches for them, sticks here. They, were, they had uh, um, pistols. The intention was that the objective here was to go and kill people there and lay the blame squarely on our doorsteps, on the party, the PDP, which I understand would have given them ground to ban the party. I think it was very timely for the military to come in and there was no way APC was going to conduct a free and fair election. And in fact, the timely intervention, if you are not for the timely intervention of the military, when elections would have taken place any time this year, the situation would have been worse than in Liberia because there would have been civil war. So this idea of saying that they were on multi-party was going on and the military came in, it's just lies. The Western countries should know that. 
and you will see from the popularity of, of, of the coup what the people fear. You see, the entire country is with them. The Western leaders described the coup initially as an unnecessary interference in the democratic process in Sierra Leone. That comment made this top lawyer and his colleagues very angry. I don't think the international community should be so insensitive or unsympathetic to our situation because they were here. They saw the level of corruption, they saw the level of mismanagement, they saw that the APC was putting forward a facade, a machinery which was not a true machinery for return to constitutional democracy. And I don't believe they did anything to bring up to the Mama government or even to threaten the Mama government by saying, look, if you don't have free and fair elections, we will not recognize the results of the elections, we would withhold aid, we would withhold assistance, which they did with other African countries. Why didn't the International Committee take up the Mama government as they did in other countries? For example, in Kenya. For example, as we've seen in Malawi. They used the stick and the carrot. And we believe that um, the International Committee should have come out strongly. I think there's a bit of hypocrisy with some of these people. Uh, much as we believe they probably have some goodwill for our country, but we believe they could have done some things in the past by bringing it out quite strongly to the government of the day that if they did not conduct free and fair elections, international assistance, international aid would be withheld, and if necessary, they would not accept the results of the elections. The United States now says, however, that it never recognized the Momo government as a democratically elected government. A U.S. spokeswoman in Freetown described the promises made by the new NPRC government as encouraging. If the coup was indeed a harmful and unnecessary intervention, Sierra Leone could have lost this. Today, at the Queen Elizabeth II Quay, Freetown's natural harbour, a new consignment of American PL-480 rice is being unloaded. The rice is given to Sierra Leone by the United States government to complement what is produced in the agricultural sector. Captain Robert Koruma is here personally to oversee the unloading operation. Captain Koruma is the new chairman of the National Aid Coordinating Committee in Sierra Leone. Before the coup, this committee was one of the most controversial government agencies because of allegations over the way it dealt with gifts and grants from foreign donors. Has all the aid coming to Sierra Leone been coming through this coordinating committee and being channeled through to the right places? No, that's, not be, that's has never been the case. It, that should have been the case, but it has never been the case. In fact, the only data that has been coming through the sector was this PL480 program. In spite of the fact that the, the aid was coming through different channels, was it ending up in the right places? No, definitely not, because in fact it was not even known to the, uh, to the public. The only those higher up in the HLO maybe knew about it, and it was, you know, something within the party, the APC party. Perhaps a more obvious case of corruption in the government of Joseph Momo involved the Sierra Leone Fire Department. As Minister of Defense, former President Momo was responsible directly for the fire services. However, under him, Sierra Leone's only fire station became a graveyard for morale and for broken down firefighting vehicles. The APC government, they don't consult. They just do what they like. And um, as a civil servant, you cannot say anything or else you'll be kicked out. When they ordered these engines, did they consult you? Well, uh, I was not consulted. It, it, was, it, it was a cabinet decision. The vehicles often broke down while answering emergencies. They were very low, you see. The spring, they have, we have a lot of springs that are... They, 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 there were so many broken springs, and then the bushes, also the, the brakes, and all, all those things. This one broke down on its first day in service. This one gave way while trying to climb a hill on its eighth day and tumbled over. One fireman was killed. Why were they in such bad shape? Well, this vehicle carries the telephone number of a fire station in Holland. Could it be then that for the first time in the fire department's history, Joseph Momo and his Lebanese agent were buying second-hand fire vehicles, endangering the lives of his people? Can you attend a fire at a multi-story building in Freetown today? We no, we cannot. Why? We haven't got a snooker. Or a turntable ladder. That's a, that's a